anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. Anyone who keeps learning is young. What a great quote from a great man whose name is right here. I want to be a lifelong student and continue to learn for as long as I can, and I hope you do too. Welcome back to class. This is AODE 4R70W class, part two, lesson five. If you recall, in the last lesson, we assembled the reverse drum and pump. We also tested the forward clutch drum, reverse drum, and pump together with air pressure to make sure that they will operate correctly. The goal of this lesson is to reinstall into the case all parts and subassemblies of the drivetrain we've been working on in the past several videos. But before we actually do this, I want to show you how the parts go together by demonstrating the reassembly outside of the case. Let's flash forward to see what this looks like. In order to end up with the correct end plate when the pump is finally installed, you must fit the drivetrain assemblies together correctly. To simplify an explanation of what goes into the case, I'll divide the parts into two groups. The first group, which would go into the case first, includes all parts and assemblies from the output shaft to the forward clutch inner hub. The second group, installed next, is made up of the remaining drivetrain components, the forward and reverse clutch drums, the intermediate clutch pack and overdrive band, as well as the pump assembly. As I said before, in order for you to see how everything fits together, we'll assemble both groups outside of the case. Let's begin by getting the output shaft assembly along with the thrust bearings and the direct clutch assembly. To begin the stack up, I'll set the output hub to case thrust bearing, which normally is the first part to place into the case, on the bench like so. On our model bearing, this lip goes down against the case. The output shaft and ring gear are installed next. The hub to direct clutch thrust bearing should be installed with the protruding lip down into the recess of the output hub. The direct clutch would normally be installed next, but we'll leave it here for the moment so that I can show you how it fits with the next component to install. Now get the planetary gear carrier reverse band, center support, and the snap ring which fastens the center support to the case. If you haven't already done so, check the planetary gears for broken teeth and then measure for acceptable end plate with a feeler gauge as you saw in an earlier video. Also examine the roller clutch 
and thrust bearing inside the carrier. Remove the one-way roller clutch assembly by lifting it out in order to inspect it for damage. Carefully push one roller at a time out of the cage like so. The rollers should be perfectly round and free of any defects such as pitting or flat areas from wear. Check all of the accordion springs closely. It's not uncommon to find them broken and needing replacement. After years of constant flexing here where the thin spring steel folds over, they can break apart from fatigue and fail. There is a replacement roller clutch assembly available if you find any of the individual parts damaged. Make sure that you determine the sun gear to carrier thrust bearing located deep inside the carrier is healthy. Unlike all of the other thrust bearings in this transmission, this one cannot be removed easily for inspection without disassembly of the planetary gears. This would require machine shop procedure and equipment beyond the means of even many professionals. We'll check it another way. Temporarily get the sun gear from the parts bench. This flat surface of the sun gear goes down against the bearing. Insert it into the carrier while rotating to engage it with the planetary gears. Now press down with your palm while turning back and forth. The feel should be silky smooth. If it does not turn freely or you feel tight spots, chattering, or even a crunchy feel, the bearing is damaged and must be replaced. Unfortunately, this means that you must replace the entire planetary carrier assembly. This bearing feels fine. I'll remove the sun gear and return it to the parts bench. Inspect the bushings here and here. I rarely find damage to this one which supports the drive shell, but a replacement is available if it is damaged. The carrier to direct clutch bushing located here, on the other hand, is often found to be badly worn. There should only be a few thousandths clearance between this bushing and the journal it rides on here in the direct clutch drum. These parts should turn freely together, but not feel sloppy. Let me show you. I'll temporarily remove the inner hub from the direct clutch assembly. As you can see, they slip together easily and turn freely, but have only a minimal side-to-side -side clearance. If the carrier rocks or wobbles on the journal in the direct clutch drum, the bushing should be replaced. To do this, drive the old bushing out with a flathead screwdriver and hammer from this direction. Install the new one from this side of the carrier by driving it in with a 1 and 1 8 inch socket extension and hammer. Beep. 
After installation, the new bushing will probably be unacceptably tight at first. If the carrier will not turn freely when installed onto the direct clutch, tap it here, here, and here with the hammer just hard enough to knock down high spots on the bushing. The bushing in the carrier is actually a new one I installed earlier and this is exactly what I had to do to free it up. I also had to polish it slightly with 220 grit sandpaper and you may have to too. These two assemblies now fit together great. Set the inner hub back into the drum. Install correctly and splined with all six friction plates, it should rest on and contact the thrust bearing. Center it as well as you can. Now that the hub is back in place, install the planet carrier again. These splines must go into the hub. To continue the stack up, I'll set the direct clutch assembly onto the thrust bearing inside the output ring gear. Now install the planetary carrier. Turn it back and forth until the splines of the carrier fall into the hub. This can take time and be frustrating. With patience and rotation, it will finally go down into place. At this point, reinstall the one-way roller clutch assembly. Add a little fluid to all of the rollers. Set it into the carrier with the side of the cage, which is solid, downward. Installed correctly, you will be able to see the top of the rollers through gaps in the cage. The reverse band tightens around this area of the planet carrier to give you reverse. Because it is normally anchored and supported by lugs and a snap ring inside the case, I'll set it aside for this demonstration. The center support, which has the inner race of the roller clutch, goes in next. Add some fluid to the bushing here. Rotate it counterclockwise. It will freewheel in this direction, allowing the inner race to move down and engage the rollers. Once again, when working correctly, the center support will turn freely in the counterclockwise direction as you hold the planet carrier stationary. It will lock and not turn in the clockwise direction.
This snap ring, when installed into a groove inside the case, fastens the center support. I'll set it aside for now. Next, I'll need the sun gear, sun gear to drive shell thrust bearing, drive shell, shell to hub thrust bearing, forward clutch inner hub, hub to forward clutch thrust bearing, and the intermediate shaft. The sun gear goes into the planet carrier like so. The thrust bearing goes onto the shaft. The dry shell goes in next. Install the shell to hub thrust bearing with this protruding lip down towards the shell. Set the hub onto the end of the sun gear shaft like so. Place the hub to forward clutch drum thrust bearing into this recess with the wider race down. The narrower inner race will contact the forward drum. Finally, install the intermediate shaft by dropping it into place. At this point, I have assembled the first of the two groups which make up the drivetrain. Now get the tested drum and pump group which we set aside earlier from lesson four. I'll also need the overdrive band and intermediate clutch pack. The stack up continues by placing the forward and reverse drums together onto the drivetrain. Remember, there should be a thrust bearing already present between the drums. Also note that the inner hub must line up and spline with the five friction plates in the forward drum during the next procedure. When installed completely, the tabs of the reverse drum will be about centered within the notches of the drive shell. The very shallow notches from where over the years, which you can see here, indicate the drum is completely down against the thrust bearing and that all five friction plates have splined with the inner hub. The overdrive band is normally positioned inside the case about here and clamps around the reverse drum to give you overdrive. I'll set it aside. The intermediate clutch pack is installed next. These plates have been ruined from heat caused by slippage. 
they'll actually be replaced with new ones later during the final assembly, but for now, I'll use them for this demonstration. First, an end plate installs into notches within the case around the mechanical diode or roller clutch. A friction plate goes in next. Then a flat steel plate. Then yet another friction plate followed by another steel plate. This stacking arrangement continues until four friction and four steel plates have been installed. Finally, the last assembly of the drivetrain, the pump, is lowered into the case and fastened with seven bolts. This is how all of the parts and sub-assemblies of this transmission fit together. Now let's reassemble it again, this time inside of the case. The remaining part of this lesson is the actual assembly of the drivetrain into the case and we'll begin now. If possible, arrange your transmission case as this one is. I positioned it upright so that I can install all parts downward into the case and there is an open area below it to accommodate the length of the output shaft. As we did during the last demonstration, get the output shaft and ring gear, output hub to case thrust bearing, the direct clutch drum, as well as the direct clutch to hub thrust bearing. Apply transmission fluid to the output hub to case thrust bearing. There are two styles of this bearing. One type has exposed needle bearings and should be placed into the case with the needles facing upward so that they contact the steel output hub. The type used in our demo transmission has two races which enclose the needle bearings inside of it. It should be installed with this lip downward towards the case. To prepare the output shaft and ring gear, add fluid to the three sealing rings case journal, and the journal and sealing rings for the direct clutch drum. Lift the assembly by the inner journal. Align the output shaft with the bore in the case and carefully lower it in. When installed completely, it should rest onto the thrust bearing and turn freely. The top edge of the ring gear should be flush with this area of the case. Get this snap ring which was placed into the parts box during disassembly. This snap ring is placed into the case like so to provide a shelf for the reverse band during assembly. The reverse band is installed next. The original band is in great condition and we could reuse it, but I'll get a new one and show you how to prepare it. 
Here's the new band. This is a component not included in an overall kit and is purchased separately only if you need it. Like the friction plates in clutch packs, a band should never be installed dry. Add a generous amount of transmission fluid to the lining. This part of the band is anchored to the case by these two lugs located here. Set it onto the snap ring and rotate it so that it engages the lugs. Get the planetary gear carrier, center support, and the snap ring which fastens the center support to the case. Prepare them by adding fluid to the gears, the thrust washer inside both bushings the elements of the roller clutch, and the inner race and bushing on the center support.
rotate the support counterclockwise so that it engages the rollers. When installed completely, the inner part of the carrier here should be flush with the support in this area. As I pointed out before, the support should turn freely in the counterclockwise direction and lock if you attempt to turn it clockwise. We will install these two parts into the case together. Keep in mind that these splines must align with and go into the splines in the hub of the direct clutch. Note also the position of this notch. The notch is there to clear the large overdrive band anchor pin here. Spread your fingers inside the carrier to lift it. Gently lower the assembly while indexing the support notch with the overdrive band anchor pin. Reach down and rotate the output shaft back and forth. The carrier will fall in only part of the way. At this point, the splines on the end of the carrier are not yet into the direct clutch hub. Reach in with both hands and slightly lift the carrier as you rotate it back and forth. It will eventually fall down further. You will know it's in the correct final position when the top edge of the support is even with the bottom of the snap ring groove here. Get the case to support silencer from the small parts box. A coil type silencer like this one was used through 2001. If you are working on a 2002 and later transmission, a simpler V-shaped type is used. Make sure that you are wearing safety glasses and press it into this gap between the support and case with your fingers. Now use a flat blade screwdriver and hammer to gently tap it just below the snap ring groove. Don't be frustrated if the silencer does not go in correctly as you see here on your first try. It may not go in evenly and slip down into the case. If this happens, remove the center support and carrier to retrieve the silencer if you have to and try again. The silencer's function is to preload the support in the counterclockwise direction against the case to prevent a clacking sound when the vehicle is placed into drive. This snap ring goes in next. AODE, 4R70W, and 4R75W transmissions use a snap ring with two upturned ends like this one. It must be positioned correctly. One end should be as you see here and the other end should be here to the right and underneath the overdrive band anchor pin. The snap ring and install position is different for a 4R70E or 4R75E. Let's take a look inside one. This is a picture of a 4R75E at the same stage of assembly. Notice the additional notch in the center support here and the turbine shaft sensor which protrudes through it. The most important thing to note here is the difference in the snap ring and its position. It has an upturned tang on one end which must be placed here. The other end of the snap ring without a tang 
should be here. The gap between the snap ring ends must be as you see here to allow the sensor to be installed. We'll now move on with the assembly. Get the sun gear, drive shell, hub to shell thrust bearing, hub, forward drum to hub bearing, and the intermediate shaft. Add some fluid to this bushing in the sun gear. Also put some on this journal. Set the sun gear to shell thrust bearing onto the shaft as removed. Add fluid to it. Install it like so. The drive shell goes in next. Put some fluid on this journal. Set it in place over the sun gear. It should turn freely. The hub to shell thrust bearing goes in next. Add fluid to it. The protruding lip of this bearing should go downward into the drive shell. The hub and hub to forward drum bearing will be installed next. Add fluid to the bearing. Set the hub onto the splined end of the sun gear like so. The thrust bearing should be placed onto the hub with the narrower race facing upward. The intermediate shaft is next. Simply drop it into place like this. Now get the assembled forward and reverse clutch drums only. Lift the pump off and set it aside for now. The thrust bearing between the drums should be in place. Set them into the transmission like so. Rotate the input shaft back and forth while lifting up slightly. Eventually all five of the forward friction plates will spline with the forward hub.
make sure the tabs on the reverse drum index with the notches in the drive shell. Finally, the forward clutch drum should go all the way down and contact the thrust bearing on top of the hub. The next part to install is the overdrive band. The original one is discolored and somewhat damaged from slipping. We'll install a new one. Like the reverse band, the new overdrive band should not be installed without applying fluid to it. Set it in like so. One lug of the band should contact the anchor pin here. The other lug will contact the apply pin of the overdrive servo assembly, which we're about to install. Get the overdrive servo piston and pin, as well as the return spring and snap ring. If you recall from an earlier lesson, I mentioned a special replacement apply pin which comes in the SureCure kit. Let's get it now. Here it is. We'll also need the two O-rings which will be installed into the grooves here and here. Here they are. According to the directions, you have the option to install this washer onto the shoulder of the pin for a firmer three to four shift feel. We won't use it in this transmission. To replace the original pin, remove this E-clip with a small screwdriver. Pull the pin out. Place the spring retainer onto the new pin. Now install the small O-ring. Put fluid on it. Install the spring and the piston. If the bonded piston seal is damaged or hard and brittle, now is the time to replace it. 
replace the E-clip. Finally, install the larger O-ring into the other groove on the pin. Put fluid or transgel onto the O-ring. Set the return spring onto the assembly. Lubricate the overdrive servo piston and pin bores with fluid. Push the assembly part way in. After the pin comes through the case, you must move the band lug over and set it onto the pin like so. Get the homemade tool and two of the longest valve body bolts. Install it again as we did during the disassembly. Turn the threaded rod to push the piston in, compressing the return spring. Make sure the band lug remains engaged to the pin. Finally, reinstall the snap ring and remove the tool. Get the intermediate friction and steel plates along with the thick end plate. This thick end plate is installed next. It should be flat across this surface as well as perfectly smooth. Set it into the case with this strengthening rib facing downward. It can only be installed one way. Note that the reverse clutch drum does not touch the plate. If the plate does contact the drum, the forward or reverse clutch drum needs to drop down further into the transmission. Rotate the input shaft back and forth until it does. The friction and steel plates go in next. 
depending on transmission model, there may be three or four of each. The original four friction and four steel plates from this transmission have been damaged from heat. We'll use the new ones from the kit. Here they are. Dip the frictions into fluid as we did with the other friction plates. Begin the intermediate clutch stack up by installing a friction plate. Now set a steel plate in. Add a friction plate. Add a steel plate. Add a friction plate, set another steel plate in, add the fourth friction plate, finally add the fourth steel plate. Now get this spring steel clip from the box. Not all transmissions have this part. If your transmission, like our demo, had it during disassembly, reinstall it by inserting it only in this location. The flat side should go against the plates. The rounded side goes towards the case. The end of the clip should be flush with the case. At this point on some models, you must set the intermediate piston return spring assembly on top of the last steel. Here's a still picture of a 4R75E. As you can see, the return spring cage has been installed. Also note that the half circle notch goes here at the 12 o'clock position in the case. Get the pump to case gasket and pump to case o-ring from the overhaul package. Install the O-ring and apply transgel or transmission fluid to it. Apply transgel or a small amount of bearing grease to the pump bore. Set the pump to case gasket in place and align it with the holes.
For a final time, add fluid to the inner sealing ring bore, bearing journals, and sealing rings of the pump. Make sure that the plastic thrust washer is still held in place by transgel or bearing grease. Align the pump with the bolt holes and lower it into the case. Get the seven pump to case bolts. They have 10 millimeter heads and are one and five eighths of an inch or 43 millimeters long. Use a 10 millimeter socket, extension, and ratchet to tighten the bolts in a cross pattern in order to pull the pump down into the case as evenly as possible. When all bolts are snug, check to make sure the input shaft will turn. If it will not, you may have a forward friction plate which hasn't splined with the inner hub. You may also have installed a thrust bearing upside down by mistake. If the shaft is locked down, remove the pump, find out what is causing the interference, and try again. The input shaft must turn freely and have some in play. We'll use an inch pounds torque wrench to tighten the bolts completely. Torque them to 220 inch pounds or 27 newton meters. This concludes lesson five. We'll continue the reassembly of the transmission in the valve body area in lesson six.